Hello, hello, this is Derek from One Over Tea. Welcome back to another episode of Tea Soup, a podcast all about tea culture, life in modern China, and Chinese tea. I'm your host, Derek Poskin. I've been living in China since 2016, and I've been drinking, buying, and selling Chinese tea for the past decade. So, pop on that kettle, heat up your teaware, and let's get this session started. Alright, so in the last episode, I gave a brief overview of a few different origin myths surrounding Bilo Chun, that blood-heavy, curled, fluffy, and green tea from Jiangsu. We covered its name changes throughout the dynasties, from Dongting tea in the Tang, scared to death fragrance in the Song and Ming, and to Bilo Chun in the Qing. Now looking strictly at recorded sources, tea in the area has been around for at least 1300 years of history and this is pretty cool especially considering you know white tea when i was looking at that its history is a little less well recorded and i had to do a little bit of digging to find even mentions of tea production in what could be fuding in the ming dynasty and whatnot and so Bilo Chun has this huge amount of history to it, and we kind of dug deeper in the last episode and looked at the more aqueous, kind of prehistoric myths about the cre- creation of Bilo Chun. One story, there's a tonic. Bilo Chun is a tonic seeded from the hero's blood after he defeats the dragon, and the girl Bilo, the singing girl, grew the tea to help heal him of his wounds. In another story, we see how it was discovered by a woodcutter, braving the mysterious, strange fragrances coming from the mountain. And as she was bringing it down the, down the mountain, it started smelling even stronger, which really scared her. And then finally, we see how it was honored with the name of Bilo Chun by the Qing Dynasty Emperor Kangxi. And so there's a huge amount of history here in this very, very small tea. And looking at all this, it kind of makes sense why this tea has been so popular for so long, why it's one of China's, you know, top 10 famous teas. And what I did last time as well, I gave you a little overview of this geographical region. And so instead of doing that again in this episode, I kind of want to look at it from a different light, in a different way. A friend of mine calls this approach the Julius Caesar method, where you stab something from multiple different angles. And this is what he uses for teaching and for educating and also for learning. So looking at where Sujo is, let's take another stab at it. So instead of starting on from the island of Taiwan and getting into Fujian, let's talk about the geographic and socioeconomic situation of Suzhou. So Suzhou is the ancestral home of Bilo Chun, right on the border of Lake Tai, right on the coast of Lake Tai. It's essentially, I think, 40 kilometers from where we'll go later in this episode, the Xishan Dao, the island in Lake Tai. 40 kilometers from there is the old city of Suzhou. Suzhou now is an incredible modern city and is one in a constellation of cities surrounding Lake Tai. This is also includes Wuxi, Changzhou, Liyang, and and even Yixing. And yes, that's the same Yixing that makes the famous Zisha teacups and teapots. And so together, these four cities create a kind of megalopolis wrapping around half of Lake Tai, and I believe that their GDP output is a huge majority of what's produced in the Jiangsu province. And so these cities are all so interconnected that they're currently working on a light rail system that can help daily commuters from one city to another travel between them. And all four of these cities are also counted into the greater Shanghai metro area, which is absolutely massive when you count these cities as well as Shanghai. And according to uh, the 2020 census, This area contains 38 million residents, 38 million people in just these handful of Jiangsu cities. That's like a tenth of the United States population. That's a huge amount of people. And so when we talk about Bilo Chun, the makers, the history, and its popularity, it's important to realize that this tea has a lot of hometown fans, a huge amount of domestic drinkers. I'll tell you about Suzhou, how everyone there is drinking it grandpa style, and I see it all the way to uh, Shanghai and even up north in Jiangsu and in, in Yangzhou. A lot of people love Bilo Chun. So perhaps a better way to find Suzhou on a map is to start at Shanghai, and then you can work your way essentially dead west. 
In fact, if you're in Shanghai, you could hop on a high-speed train and be in Suzhou within 30 minutes. The proximity to one of the biggest cities on the planet and the fact that Jiangsu province is one of the wealthiest provinces per capita in China is a huge region, reason why this tea is so successful and so popular. However, this understanding of socio and economic geographical grounding of Bilo Chun will really help illuminate some of the incredible complexities surrounding the myth of the tea farmers that are producing it and the reality of some of the tea farmers I've met living on this island because their worlds are just so totally different. It'll be just a really great juxtaposition. Now, as this episode is entirely about Bilo Chun, let me give you a brief reintroduction to it in case you haven't had it in a while. I just weighed some out, and one thing that always strikes me by this tea is the sheer amount of tea fuzz or tea down that is on these buds, on these leaves. And as I was weighing it out, there were just huge clouds of those tiny hairs from the tea bud floating in the sun, coming out of the cup and everything. And even my hands got kind of covered in this yellow, white tea fuzz. And so that's a huge characteristic of this tea for me. And one thing you see when you're brewing it, the liqueur is almost opaque with kind of this tea down, if you will. Sometimes people call it the tea hairs. Some people call it the tea down, the tea fur. But really what these are, these are the trichomes that are right on the tea bud. And you see a whole lot in the white teas, in the fooding white teas, in the Da Bai Hao varietal, but also in this tea. And I'll talk later in the, when we talk about the production of Bilo Chun, kind of how these tea, tea buds create those hairs and create this really fuzzy tea and how the makers can kind of keep it on the tea or lose some of it due to their processing. The way we brew this tea is we take a glass of about 80 degree water Celsius and then we just dump about three grams of the tea into the top of it. And what happens is if it's good Bilo Chun, it should almost settle right immediately and then start unfurling at the bottom of the cup. The smell of this tea is rather sweet and citrusy, uh, very, very floral. And we'll talk about you know some of the superstitious reasons why this tea tastes so citrusy and so fruity later. But it should be rather strong. It should be a, a powerful green tea. This is not a delicate light green tea. This is thick, umami, rich, and lasting. So it's a really, really lovely Chinese green tea, in my opinion. Now, in this episode, what I want to do is give you some real context for the dis my discovery of this tea, the people responsible for making it, how to get out into that island, how to get to Suzhou, and essentially the whole living culture of the tea. But before I do that, I want to talk about how I found this connection, how I made this connection. And I kind of want to cycle back to something I talked about in an earlier episode, the four different kinds of luck. I believe I talked about this in episode three. So go back there for the full overview really quickly to break up the four different types of luck. The first one is blind luck. The second is luck from motion. The third is luck from awareness. And the fourth is luck from uniqueness. And while I just gave a really brief overview of these different types of luck last time, this concept seems to have resonated with a lot of you guys because you've reached out to me in many different messages and emails and talked about your experiences of these different types of luck, your thoughts on a lot of times it's the luck by uniqueness is a lot of people have different views on that. And so maybe I didn't quite explain it in the proper way. Maybe my explanation was insufficient. Again, if you're curious about these types of luck, uh, it comes from the book called Chase, Chance, and Creativity, The Lucky Art of Novelty by James H. Austin, published in 1979, I believe. And this was uh, by a neurologist who really studied what kind of happens in the brain when you believe yourself to be lucky or when you describe your lucky situations. And so I want to dig in on this one again and kind of talk about that last one, the luck from uniqueness. Because some of you have messaged me talking about how you experience this level of luck simply by being unlike everyone else. I think when I initially brought up the idea, I said when you get this level of notoriety, people began coming to you. But other people mentioned that just by being unique, by being different from everyone else, you are on this unique path and your uniqueness is kind of like a magnet or fortune. And perhaps it creates a lot more of these specifically like-minded opportunities. And somebody mentioned that 
once you find your niche, you become more and more specialized. And at a certain point, the people in your niche are fewer and fewer, and your teachers are more likely to manifest. So you tend to find each other through this idea of scarcity and not through notoriety. And well, to those of you who haven't experienced the sheer serendipity of these kinds of synchronicities, it might sound like a little bit of new age belief or whatever you want kind of dogma where you can manifest your own fortune. And yet, having had so many of these absolutely mind-boggling situations of a precisely unique fortune falling into my lap, I have to agree that this is something magical that happens when you find your own unique path. I don't know if I told this story, but I wanted to. This was my first time in Dian To in Fuding. I was at a tea house and I was drinking tea with Cho. And one of the neighbors comes in with some tea candies that she had made. And she's looking at me and she says, is your name Dan Ching? And I'm like, yes, that's my Chinese name. And I, I don't think anyone in this village has said it. I, this is my first time in the village. And I say, how do you know my name? She's like, you have a tea master in Jiangsu, right? And I say, yes, yes, I do. Again, how do you know this? She shows me my tea master's WeChat and says, your tea master came here five years ago. <laughs> and I took him out to Taimushan and I took him to this and that. And I follow him on WeChat and I've seen him post videos of you making tea in Jiangsu. And I'm like, no way, you, you have to be kidding me. And she eventually calls my tea master and my tea master has no idea I'm traveling. And so he gets the call. He's like, what's going on here? And it's a video chat. And then he sees me. He's like, Dan Ching, wait, what? He's so confused because it's like a phone call from, you know, a fooding place. Somebody he met five years ago calling him with me. And again, China is what, 1.4 billion people. And yet by finding this own unique path, the amount of people that travel this path are fewer and fewer. And so the fact that both me and my tea master went to almost the exact tea shop in you know some rural fooding village, it's not as absurd as it sounds. Now, personally, I've always been taken by the late Joseph Campbell's view on following your bliss. And to quote him in his beautiful series, The Power of Myth with Bill Moyers, Campbell says that, follow your bliss... If you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that's been there all the while waiting for you. And the life you ought to be living is the one you are living. And when you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in the field of your bliss, and they open doors for you. I say, follow your bliss and do not be afraid. And doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. If you follow your bliss, doors will open for you that wouldn't have opened for anyone else. And this quote for me is just fantastic and, you know, just a guiding, guiding light in my life. And for those of you who have had these kinds of experiences, the sentiment really strikes through time and time again. I mean, how many, how many times in the most unexpected places do you find incredible lucky situations for you? And usually it happens when you are on your path. You're, you're doing something that you really enjoy, that you're blissed out about, and then something miraculous happens. And also, like to quote another book that's probably a little closer to home for many of us, in Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, there's the retelling of the hero's journey, and away from the known, into the vast unknown, in pursuit of a treasure, in pursuit of a dream. It's you know rather a common motif. And in this book, it's kind of summed up in the famous line, when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. And that's that feeling Joseph Campbell's talking about when you're on that track of bliss and you feel compelled, you feel pushed, like thermals lifting you up and visibly upward. When you're on that track of bliss, it doesn't feel like you're being alone. It feels like everything is surrounding you and the whole universe is right there with you, helping you along. Now, to bring it back down to earth a little bit, I want to add another level to this luck conversation. A friend of mine turned me on to another interesting book all about luck called The Luck Factor, Changing Your Luck, Changing Your Life, The Four Essential Principles by Dr. Richard Wiseman. And this book is another deep dive into the mechanics of luck and really looks at what makes people lucky and really looks at the lucky people. 
And one interesting find about it is that a lot of the lucky people believe themselves to be lucky. And so now we get into this Euroborosian what came first paradox, the luck or the feeling of being lucky. And additionally, a huge factor looking at the data of people who consider themselves to be lucky and are successful and have these successful lucky situations, a majority of them are extroverts. And so this kind of finding for me as a, as a rather introverted person was a, a bit of a hard pill to swallow, but it does make sense. And this is really that luck from motion, this idea of making connections. So luck is opportunity. Luck is these kinds of connections. Luck is getting out of your comfort zone. And as Joseph Campbell would say, walking your hero's journey, finding your own uniqueness, and also not being afraid to reach out to people on that path. And so this is most clearly exemplified in the two ideas, two situations, where one is you're sitting alone by yourself in a room, and the other is you are walking around, you're in a coffee house, you're talking to everyone you're meeting. One of these situations has a lot more opportunities for that lucky dart to strike. And so one example of this is what if you're you know, in a coffee house, working by yourself, being quiet, not talking to anybody, and you're faced with this problem that you can't quite solve, you, you need somebody's help with, and that at the table next to you, there's somebody with the capabilities to help you who is also looking for somebody with your unique kind of set of skills. So as an extrovert, you would be bored to tears by just sitting at a coffee house and not talking to anyone, right? <laughs> and so you would have to, you would want to reach out and talk to everyone and meet everyone, see what they're working on, see just general, who are they, what are they doing and everything. An introvert, if those two people were introverts with the opportunities, they would go in that coffee house, not talk to anyone, leave the coffee house, and not be any closer to finding that lucky situation, that lucky person. And so for me, even though I'm an introvert, I absolutely love extroverts. I mean, I think they're absolutely phenomenal kind of peoples that just need this interaction. I mean, I had a guy I worked with down in Chaozhou, and he was the biggest extrovert ever. After lunch in southern China, it's common to take a nap, right? And so everyone in the whole office would turn off the lights. People would get out their little cots, and people would get blankets, and everyone would just take a nap. But he, for whatever reason, he just couldn't sleep. And so he would just sit there at his desk, wide awake, patiently waiting for people to wake up so he could start talking to them. And sometimes, even though I would, you know, put my head down on my desk and start sleeping, he would just keep talking to me in kind of a whispered voice and telling me all these things, kind of nudging me every now and then. God bless him. I mean, that's, that's the kind of energy I'm trying to cultivate in myself this year. But to be honest, while I consider myself quite a big introvert in my passions, my hobbies, the fact that I can keep my own company for days on end, weeks on end. You know, lockdown was fantastic for me. I just stayed in my apartment and I was super productive. Uh, but here in China, I've really become much more extroverted. And maybe it's because I really love practicing my Chinese, but I talk to really everyone. I talk to people I'm sitting next to on the train. I joke with the cab drivers. I ask bus drivers really detailed questions about locations, you know, tea locations and whatnot. And I laugh and I haggle with people in the market. I talk to people in the hostels all the time. I really want to find these new places and talk to people and see what they know. And that is, you know, the key to kind of being lucky. And so it was in just one of these situations that turned out to be this golden egg of a tea connection in the Bilo Trin production area, in that mountainous island in the middle of Lake Tai in the Xishan Dao. So here's the story that brings it all back around to the Bilo Trin sourcing trip. Here in Jiangsu, in Yangzhou, Jiangsu, I was walked by a tea house. You know, I saw a bunch of people in there drinking tea, and I'm like, you know what? That looks really nice. And so I just walked in. Walked in, I asked them, okay, what tea are you drinking? This is like May or June of 2020. And so there's me, bold enough just to go into this tea house that I've never been into, to talk to these people I have no idea who they are, interrupt their tea, tea time, and just ask them, all these kinds of questions. And eventually I found out what they're drinking is some Ming Chen Bilo Chun. Do you want to, do you want to drink it? It's fantastic. And I'm kind of asking it, asking them where it comes from. And they're showing me photos and stuff from this, this woman's WeChat. And I'm like, wow, that looks really, really lovely. I'd love to get some. And they say, oh, they're actually sold out this year. But how about I give you their WeChat connection 
and you can try and get some next spring because their production is so small that they sell out very quickly. And so just like that, I got a connection into the Shishandao mountain region for some really nice Ming Chen traditional made Bielo Chun. So this was late spring in 2020. Fast forward a few months, I just couldn't wait. And so when I had some time off in the summertime, I decided to go check out this island myself. And so I talked to the lady on WeChat. It was actually her, how do I say it? Her father-in-law is the one who's making all the tea. And she's the one who essentially communicates and talks to everyone on WeChat and organizes the, the selling of the teas a little bit. And so I talked to her about coming out and visiting the island. She was like, well, you know, we're all done picking. And I was like, yeah, but I would just like to see it. And so she invited me out there, said, for sure, I can come out and just see kind of the situation. And so in the summertime, I go to Sujo and then get out to the lake. But first, let's talk about Sujo, kind of the feeling of being in Sujo. Now, I've been in China since 2016, and most of this time is in Yangzhou, Jiangsu. I spent a whole year, 2021, down in Chaozhou and Guangdong. And the cultures of these two different provinces, these two cities, are so, so totally different. And I realized that I really appreciate Jiangsu culture. And it's kind of hard to kind of express what Jiangsu culture is. But this whole area where the Yangtze kind of meets the ocean, this is a huge cradle of civilization that people have been living in for so long. And the culture is so deep. My experiences here in Jiangsu is this feeling of kind of a relaxed method of life with still a lot of very cool, modern things happening. So Suzhou is a very, very modern city. And my city in Yangzhou is an ancient city that's kind of, you know, semi-modern. We have our old town and we have the new town. And you'll see this in, in Suzhou as well. Jiangsu as a province in itself has a really high level of education, a high level of, you know, as we mentioned, GDP, a lot of wealth, a lot of education and learning. And to give you an example of the education here being higher than in other parts of China, if you look at the Gaokao, the Gaokao is kind of the standardized test. It's a huge, terrifying test they give to all high schoolers. And this determines what you can study in college, if you can go to college, and then what colleges you can go to. And I think the last time I checked the statistics, it's essentially three out of five students pass it. And so two out of every five don't pass the Gaokao. And depending on the province, the Gaokao is di more difficult to get a pass grade. Say in Jiangsu, you need to get 86, and that's a pass. Where in Yunnan or something like that, maybe a 72 is a pass. Why is this more difficult? Because the levels, the scores in Jiangsu are a little higher, and there are only so many places, so many students can pass the Gaokao. And so it's more difficult here because more people are higher, high, more highly educated. It's more competitive and whatnot. And so the whole general feeling of this whole Jiangsu area is one where people know their history, people know their culture, people have really in-depth conversations. And so that's why I really enjoy living here because you have this mix of modern society and understanding of culture and ancient ruins. And so getting into Suzhou, Suzhou is kind of considered the Venice of China, where it's just interlaced with canals. Every other block, it seems like there's a canal. And these canals are the huge lifeblood of the city. And while Suzhou is particularly well-renowned for its canals, it's not unique for them. Uh, really, there's a smaller town outside of Suzhou called Tongli, and this is a really beautiful, still ancient styled canal town. But my city, Yangzhou, Jiangsu, has tons of canals. There's canals going all through the city. This whole area where the Yangtze kind of, in ancient times, it would flood this whole area all of the time. I believe Yangzhou used to be a port city on the ocean, and right now it's way, way far from the ocean. And this is just the changing of times, and living in the same location for so many hundreds and thousands of years, stuff changes. But here you'll see a whole lot of marshes, you'll see a lot of these lakes. If you look on a map near even what I talked about earlier, Shaoxing in the last episode, I believe, if you look at Shaoxing, if you look at Jiangsu, if you look at Suzhou, you'll see just this huge 
amount of small little lakes and these little rivers and canals connecting everything. So Suzhou is kind of a tourist destination for a lot of people because of its beautiful old city, because of its architecture, because of its canals, because of its culture and its food. And it's really, it really is lovely. What I like about it is, like I said earlier, that mix between modern city and ancient city. And it's really, does a really good job of preserving both and encouraging both. In the city center, you get the the pants building. <laughs> this is like the gateway to the east, I think, but it really just looks like a pair of pants. It's a really iconic building for Suzhou. Another thing that's very common in Suzhou and common in this whole Jiangsu area is the profusion of people drinking green tea in a big glass, grandpa style. And so this is kind of where the term grandpa style comes from because usually the people drinking tea like this are the older generations. They're the baoans, the security guards, they're the police officers, they're the taxi drivers, they're the people sitting in the parks and they just have a huge amount of tea in a, in a very, you know, not so small glass, you know, maybe like eight ounces glass or something like that. And I remember one time when I first got to Suju, I saw this and I was asking them, I was like, oh, is that Bilo Chun? And the guy's like, no, this isn't Bilo Chun. And I'm like, well, what tea is it? And he's like, it's Chao Ching. And I'm like, interesting, you're drinking Chao Ching. Then I realized later, as I mentioned, Chao Ching is just a sub-variant of Bilo Chun. It's just not the best grade of it. This is like the, the stuff the farmers drink themselves. It's, it's rather cheap. And so when I visited in the summertime, Suzhou was so, so hot. I stayed in a hotel and a hostel, and I was talking to everyone there about, you know, where the best Bilo Chun comes from. And I was like, maybe I'll go to Dongting Mountain while I'm here. I have a date in the Shishan Dao area. And the locals, the people that were running the hostel, were like, you know, Bilo Chun, the production area, it mostly comes from Shishan Dao, but the touristy place, if you want to see, like, the old city, the old Song Dynasty, like, the street and stuff like that that's all out in the Dongting area the Dongting peninsula and i was like interesting so the Dongting is not really where all the bilochun comes from they said nope you should definitely go to shishan dao and i was like that's fascinating because that's totally different from everything i've been reading online but it tracks with you know this great connection i have out on the shishan dao island and so Trying to get to Shishan Dao from Suzhou is actually really difficult because it's about 40 kilometers away from the city center, and yet there's this causeway that takes, it's about a 10 kilometer bridge that connects, connects the mainland with the island, and that's a trip that not a lot of cabs want to take because you can go there, but then going back, you'll be an empty cab. And so usually if they do do it, they'll charge you both ways, and that's a that's, uh, tough pill to swallow the other way to get there is by the number 11 bus the number 11 bus costs four kwai which is about 50 cents and it will take you there the only problem is it takes two hours and this is like i remember taking the subway all the way to the the furthest west i could get to the lake and then hopping on the number 11 and it still took me like an hour and 45 minutes and i was like oh by the time you get to the shishan dao island there are a few buses that make the circuit, but they're uh, really, really slow. They maybe come every hour or something like that. So eventually what I did is I messaged the lady who invited me out there, and she drove and picked me up and drove me out to her little village. And so getting around on the island is really difficult. But let's talk about the island itself. So as I mentioned, it's about 40 kilometers from Suzhou City. It's got a 10-kilometer bridge that connects it with the mainland. And that bridge didn't exist for a long time. And so the only way to get to the island was through boat. And even on that bridge, as I was getting out there, I saw all of these old style Chinese fishing boats. And it looked really beautiful with the sails, the ribbed sails up and everything. It's fantastic against like the blue background. And so this bridge was created not so long ago. And then even more recently, it was upgraded from just a single lane, like a a single path with like a a dotted line separating those coming and those going to two different roads now with a real divider. And so now you can actually get there pretty easily, relatively speaking. The island itself is about 11 kilometers north to south and 15 kilometers east to west. And the peak, the mountain, rises some 336 meters above the sea level. On this island, there's a population of about 50,000 people and 12 main villages. 
The first thing you'll notice on this island is the profusion of fruit trees. I saw everything from peach trees to red date trees to chestnut trees, persimmon trees, yang mei trees. What is that? Like waxberry or bayberries and apple trees. So many, so many different types of fruit. Oh, the pea pops, the loquats are particularly famous here. And so what's interesting is you see how isolated this island is from the mainland. And supposedly, according to who we'll talk to later, Master Chen, the soil here is slightly acidic. And because of its acidity, the Bilochun cultivar, or heirloom varietal, does really well on this island. And so do all the fruit trees. And he says there's a connection between the fruit trees and the tea itself. But we'll get into that a little later. So the island's not so bad big and so it didn't take long from when I was picked up to when we arrived at the production household and the production household is right in a small little village under the at the foot of a mountain and the house is really nice the house has you know a gate you have to open up you drive into the courtyard you park there's a really nice outdoor courtyard there's the tea production area there's the kitchen there's the eating eating dining room and then there's a main building where you go into the main building and you have the living room, the bathroom, another kitchen, you have the rooms upstairs. So it's a relatively large house. And this is what a lot of the country houses here in China kind of look and feel like. But one interesting thing is we get into this very nice household and, you know, they're eating a snack. And what's the snack? The snack is steamed pumpkin, literally just a pumpkin that's been steamed and everyone's just tearing it apart and eating it. And this is created this was made by the the grandmother and it's a really really basic simple cheap food and i think she grew the pumpkin herself and so what's really cool is we're seeing this already this mix of the new culture and the old culture and as this was summer vacation the grandson was there too and the grandson was so excited to see a foreigner because he's been studying english and he's hilarious he's so excited to talk to me and he's super he's using half english half chinese He's showing me around the whole household. He's showing me the chickens that they keep in the back. He's showing me like the newts that they have in the in the well and stuff like that. And he's really excited to show me everything. And it's so cool to see like the new generation, the old generation. And I see this a lot in China. We'll talk about it later because there's a huge, huge, massive cultural gap between the new generation, the parent generation, and the grandparent generation. And when these all collide and connect together, they create this really, really interesting harmony. But all of this and the main character of the episode is still not here. So the master who makes the Bilo Chun, Master Chen, he's not in the household. Again, I mentioned it's summertime, so it's really hot. We're sitting inside. There are some fans on. We're eating steamed pumpkins. And I'm trying to figure out where the tea maker is. Because this is the preliminary visit. This is me just saying, is this are, is the land good? Does the tea maker know what he's doing? How are the prices? How are the teas? How's the whole environment? Is this actually what I what I'm signing up for? And then what I'll do is I'll go back in spring and I'll just go there for like one or two days, really really quick, see the production, buy the tea, and then leave. So this first trip, uh, in the Chinese terms, this would be called like the Guanxi trip. This is building the connection getting to know your tea farmer. And I recorded all of this in a YouTube video. It's the Bilo Chun Jiangsu Green Tea Sourcing Trip. And I, I show you the whole village. The videos has like the trip into the island, the people making the tea in the fields and whatnot. And so what happens is eventually Master Chen comes walking in wearing a really thin shirt that's totally soaked through in sweat. And everyone's just like, where have you been? What were you doing? He says, I was helping the neighbors water their plants. And by plants, he means the tea fields in the mountain. And so he had hiked all the way up into the mountain. This is midday. This is around 1 or 2 p.m., hottest time of the day. He walks up the mountain, helps the neighbors water their tea plants, and then just walks down. And that's just a normal day. This guy is 67 years old. He's thin as a whistle, if you will. He's just all, all bones, wiry muscles, and a huge, huge smile. He's, he's laughing because his grandson is here. He's, he's radiating this great energy. And I'm there because I kind of feel bad because I want to see the tea fields. And so like, oh, you just came from the tea garden, huh? 
And I'm like, you know, I want to go back up to the tea garden. He's like mopping the sweat off his face. And he's like, okay, yeah, let's go back up. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe we should wait a little for you to cool down first. And then we can walk back up. And so we do. We, we drink a little bit of water. We, we rest a little bit. He cools down. And then we walk back up the mountain. And again, this is my favorite part of the whole tea experience because the people who live on this island walk through and they tell you everything about the land. He's like, here's this, this tree is 800 years old. And the grandson's like, yeah, there used to be a family of squirrels that lived in there, but I haven't seen them in a while. And <laughs> he's showing me all of these fossils that are coming out of the, the ocean or the lake and everything. He's like, oh, look, there's another fossil. There's another fossil. And we walk up into the tea fields and we look at it and he's telling me all about the soil and he's pointing out the fruit trees. And so to give you a view of this, what's interesting is this little area of the Shishandao Island in the gardens, it's very organized. There's this plot is this family's, this plot is this family's, but it's all on the same mountain. And there's even, you know, stone steps that walk up it. It's very similar to what I saw in the West Lake area for the Longjing production. Everything's very clean. Everything's very modern. There's, you know, stone stairs that you can essentially walk through the entire mountain on a peaceful morning or something. As we're walking through, Old Master Chen's pointing out the different trees. Say, says, oh, this is a banli. This is the chestnut. This is the red date. This is the hongzao. And all through the tea fields, you'll see one, two, three, a cluster different types of fruit trees and they're just growing interspersed with everything you still have the really nice or clean terraced fields but you're also coming across every now and then tombs and stuff on the mountainside and so this whole area it's a it's an island culture where everything's space is kind of a rare commodity and so a lot of stuff is put together and put on top of each other and this is where chen starts pointing out the different soil and he says He's lived here for, what, 60 years, and he says the soil here is very unique. A lot of plants don't do well in this soil. What does well is the heirloom varietal, the bilochun. What doesn't do well are all of the other, or a lot of the other tea varietals. They've tried to cultivate other types of tea here, the, the Dabai Hao varietal from Fuding, and they just don't do well in this slightly acidic soil. And he says the acidic soil and the perfusion of fruit trees coalesce to give the tea itself a slightly more fruity, a slightly citrus taste. And while that's a little point of contention there, it's really something you don't really think about unless you visit the field and you see and you smell the amount of fruit trees in the air and you see just how much is kind of grown in concert with each other. And it's not a monoculture. It's not a just a mountain full of tea plants. It's a whole system. And so to kind of consider the fact that probably the whole system does affect the final result. And so it's not a very far stretch if you kind of think maybe the fruit trees, the profusion of fruit trees, the acidic soil, maybe that affects the taste of the tea. And so again, it's high summer. It's afternoon. It is so hot up here that we don't spend a whole lot of time in the fields. We walk down pretty quick sit back in the house, drink some water, drink some tea. And I start asking Chen about his history. And his grandson is really funny, telling me his whole story. And old, old Master Chen is just laughing about it because his son is cutting to like the really, th the points that he finds interesting. He's like, Grandpa's not from the island. And Grandpa's like, what? I lived on this island all my life. He's like, and his son's like, no, you were born in Zhejiang. And Old Master Chen's like, yeah, we were born in Zhejiang. And then the kid's like, yeah, but you were really poor, so you had to move to the island. And Chen's like, yeah, that was 1959. That was like the three years of natural disasters, and we, there was never enough food for anybody. Everyone was starving. A lot of people were dying, and, and that's when I moved to my Lao, Lao Po Jaws. This is my mother-in-law's house on this island. And ever since then, I've never left the island. And the kid's like, yep, he's never left the island. And he's like, since I moved here 60 years ago, I have never left this island. And that's a really mind-boggling kind of situation. It reminds me of Cho and his story about living in America for 16 years and calling his fiance once every month and saving every penny for his return to China. Old Master Chen moved to this 90-square-kilometer island when he was 7 or 8. And after 60 years of spring, summers, autumns, winters on the island... He's never left its shores. Uh, 
And I guess like, yeah, he just found this place, sank deep, deep roots into it and has just been content. And I see this contentment in him, in him and his community here. When I first arrived, like I said, he was out with his neighbors watering their tea plants in drought. And his friends are just like him. They're old comrades who have been living here for a whole long and they've seen so much history. So let's talk about some of the history he's seen. So Chen is 67. He was born in a small village in Zhejiang in 1954. And that's just five years after the founding of the People's Republic of China by Mao Zedong. And this is essentially 1949 marks the first time in the past 100, 110 years that China is really at a state of peace. Because in the past hundred years before this, there had been about seven major bloody conflicts on Chinese soil. And to recount these, so back in the 1800s, you have the two opium wars. This is 1840, 1850. Then you have the Taiping Rebellion, whose casualty count is in the tens of millions. This is a huge rebellion that totally destabilized the Qing dynasty. Then at the turn of the century, in the early 1800s, you get, or early 1900s, you get the Boxer Rebellion. And this is yet another death blow to the Qing Dynasty, which eventually fell in 1911. And then you have all of these revolutions going on, people fighting for power, vying for power. You see the Chinese-Japanese wars at this time. You see the world wars going on in the West. And then World War II happening here. And then the Civil War through this as well, which eventually ended in 1949. By this time, you see over 100 years of just bloodshed, of a war-torn country. And so the communists are victorious here, and yet the China they inherit is nearly fatally weakened by so much so much war, so much like weakened infrastructure. The government changes constantly, very little economy. Essentially, every other way that China Chen is born into is one of peace and yet one with a whole lot of problems. And so following up on his story, he was born in Zhejiang, but then there was no food. Why was there no food? Chen, Chen says that this was the San Yan Zai Hai, the three years of natural disasters, which happened in 1959, 1960, and 1961. During that time, there were huge amounts of famine. And although it's been called the three years of natural disasters, it's, it's a clear propaganda method to kind of change what actually happened. Where, yes, there were huge famines during this time, but they were not only caused by drought and flooding, but largely caused by the absurdly mishandled economic reforms during the early stages of the PRC. Now, what they're trying to do right now is stimulate growth, stimulate economy, stimulate agriculture, and everyone's all for it, but everyone's kind of <laughs> exaggerating their numbers. And so trying to recover from the economic ruin, there's this huge push to create infrastructure. Everyone's smelting steel. Everyone's increasing the yield of their crops. And you might have heard of this moment. It's called China's Great Leap Forward. And getting back to Yu Hua's book, China in 10 Words, he recounts this as... It almost sounds like a romantic and absurd comedy. So he writes that in 1958, everyone is being pushed to produce as much as they can. But tragically, nobody is fact-checking the numbers. And so people are saying that they're producing huge amounts of grain when there's really very little grain being produced. Yu Hua writes that at that time, in 1958, even the most productive rice field could only produce about 1.5 tons of rice per acre. And yet there were reports in the People's Daily saying that rice production in Huanjiang County, Guangxi, reaches 6.5 tons per acre. And so these absolutely bogus claims about production yield are echoed all around China at this time. So on paper, crop production looks incredible, you know, 10 times what it was last year. And local commun communes created community dining halls. They're so excited. They're like, everyone eat as much as you can, produce as much as you can. And there are these eating contests going on. Everyone's feeling just this general feeling of Saturnalia. We're like, we've got it. So much food. There's a fet of food of plenty, cornucopia. And then the next year, very, very quickly, the falsified numbers catch up to the reality. And in 1959, one of the worst famines envelops China. 
And this is the moment that Chen moves from Zhejiang to that Xishan Dao Island. And on Xishan Dao, there seemed to be enough food. There seemed to be kind of a, a safe haven from this world in chaos. And as a result, he put down deep roots and has never felt the need to leave. And so talking more about his history. So when he was here, he started working on a production team to produce tea when he was at 17, when he was 17. So about 50 years of experience taking care of tea fields, picking tea, making the tea. This was that highly collectivized Maoist era where everything was state-owned. The land, the tea, it was an SOE, that's the term, the state-owned enterprise. And that was responsible for the production and the distribution of the tea. We see this in neighboring Yixing as well, by the way, when they're talking about factory one teapots. These are the SEOs, or sorry, the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises that are controlling all of this, controlling the clay, controlling the production, controlling the decimation of it. Chen doesn't say that he started making tea by himself until the 1980s. And this is the Gaiga Kaifang, the economic reforms initiated by Deng Xiaoping. And this was what really starts breaking up the state-owned enterprises, decollectivizing the agricultural land, the industry and all of that, and opens up privatization. So now all the land can be privatized. The and entrepreneurs are coming out of the woodwork to open their own factories, to start making their own industry. And this is when a lot of people hop in and became ultra rich in the next couple decades. The term here that was coined, it becomes pretty famous, is socialism with Chinese characteristics. And though with my experience living in China for so long, it kind of feels like runaway capitalism with a strong central government that swats down anyone who gets too big or anyone who violates the Chinese moral compass. Anyways, Chen talks about this moment in time, the 1984, as when he becomes his own tea maker. And so he says there's the de redistribution of the land on Xishan Dao. And so what happens is the government-owned land suddenly becomes the people's land. And so when they collectivized, when the collectivized state-owned enterprise broke up, they distributed all the land fairly. Fairly as in everyone gets a share in the distribution. And it takes into consideration, though, your age, your dependence, your labor power. And so Chen says that older folks with no dependence got less land. Younger people with new families got more. And when I hear Chen talk about this, there's a certain large level of pride in this like you can see his face light up about the changes that happened about what they did and the whole time he's telling me the story i feel this sense of just great gratitude of pride of contentment he's so happy with his lot in life and you can see that in his eyes and you feel this overwhelming aura of just sheer gratitude and and pleasure at, at having this because he can send his child, his grandson to an international school in the city. His son drives, you know, a nice electric powered car and does a very good job. And he grew up literally starving to death, moving to this island with nothing, seeing all of this history, living through all this history. And this is one very fascinating part about China. In these few generations, there's been so much change. You can talk to people who've lived through all of this history. And this is why a lot of people in China are totally content and totally happy with the changes they're seeing, especially the older generation. And the older generation, a lot of times, are the ones looking after the children now. And so you kind of get this skipped, this absent generation of the parents who are, you know, tied into this really, really mega long work week and really focused on earning as much money as they can, making as much money as they can. And yet the, the grandparents who live through so much history, they see the development, they see the changes, what used to be, what is, what is possible. And so there's this general feeling of sheer delight at this lot in life. And so without making too many general generalizations, this older generation of Chinese farmers especially who have lived through so much history and have found a foothold in these mountains, living under the sun, working in the fields, they're usually whipped thin, all bones, but huge, easy smiles. 
And hearing Chen talk about all of this and seeing it through his eyes, through his life, his overwhelming emissions of gratitude, his deep, deep contentment with his current life, they all feel so helplessly genuine that it's hard not to be moved to awe in his presence. Like, how could a starving child fleeing famine in the 60s grow up to have film crews visit him every spring just to watch him do what he's been doing for the past 40 years, making Bilo Chun? He's got so much respect. He's making such a great product. He has such a difficult time, though, charging money for it. He'll never tell me how much it costs. I always ask him how much his tea is, and he says, talk to my son. Talk to my son's wife. They, they do all the money stuff because I can tell he gets awkward about it. He gets uncomfortable. This is a guy who was doing it for, you know, stipends. He was doing it just for, you know, his ticket for his meal ticket, his water, water, not water, but his oil ticket, his liquor ticket, his vegetable ticket, his clothing ticket. He's not used to saying, okay, it costs 500 US dollars now. <laughs> and so there's a very interesting thing, a moment where I agreed on a price with the wife. And then after watching Chen make the tea, I wanted to buy the tea, but then the son comes in and the, his son from the city is like, oh, I need this many pounds of tea. And then his wife, Chen, and they're like, well, you know, this guy wants to buy a certain amount. And then the son and I kind of talk and the son's like, okay, what if I give it to you for this much money and that much money? And eventually he ends up charging me, you know, a few, you know, $10, $20 more than he was supposed to. And then later that night, the wife messages me, who I was my initial contact, and she's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so embarrassed. Here, take this money back. And I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. And she's like, nope take this money back we agreed on a price like don't listen to my husband and i'm like oh my gosh am i stepping into something i shouldn't be stepping into here <laughs> and then but eventually I, I i took the money back i was like thank you I, I really appreciate you know your commitment to the price we set whatever and now she's very friendly to me every time i want to buy tea she helps me out and this year when i told her how much tea i want to get she's like that shouldn't be a problem don't worry about it we'll make sure that you get that amount of tea all right, so I kind of went way overboard on this episode. I'm past my time limit. I guess this episode turned into quite a few tangents, a lot of history, and kind of a personality sketch on our producer Chen, a little bit on the island, the area of Sujo, and all of that jazz. But I found it very fascinating, so I hope you did as well. In the next episode, maybe I'll have to go back and talk about the Bilo Chun production. I was hoping to get into the Dragonwell green tea history, a quick overview on that. But as I was recording this, I got a phone call from my tea master, and he says that he's going back to the Xishan Dao, or I think Dong Ting Shan. We have different people that we buy tea from. <laughs> and so he's going to go to uh, Suzhou on the 27th, and that's actually when I was planning on going to Zhejiang to look for the Dragonwell. And so he said that maybe we should go together. So maybe next next week I'll have a little more hands-on experience of making the tea, how much tea goes into the, how much labor goes into the tea itself, and we can really talk a little bit more about that next episode or the next episode. Anyways, thank you so much, guys, for listening. This is Derek from One River Tea reminding you: if you have 2022 green teas at home, drink them now. They're not going to last. There's some new 2023 green teas about to come out, about to hit the market. So until next time, drink your green teas, empty out that cupboard, and brew happy.